Thank you for your patience. As you see, technology has a lot to do with accessibility or the impeding of accessibility. <laughs> We're going to try to sort that out today. Uh, my name is Nancy Proctor. I'm not going to go on at length because we have so many fabulous speakers who have come here from around the world to lead this entire theme, this entire strand of accessibility sessions throughout MCN 2011. Um, Marcus Weizen, I, I would like to thank in particular for bringing this group together and finding all sorts of ways to fund people's flights and hotels to come here. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to just ask Marcus to go ahead and lead us off, and I'll just be doing timekeeping until the very end. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you all hear me well? Um, I'd also like to thank Nancy and MCN because collaboration involves MCN as well. One of the reasons for us to be here together is also to connect across boundaries, and we shall soon see why. Um, so I'll be talking to you about three ideas, cultural rights, creativity of institutions, and organizational change to improve accessibility. I just thought we want to reflect on why we are here today and have this beautiful meeting of people from across the world beginning to share ideas and different fields of competence. One is indeed that great change about technology that will become central to the lives of museums. And as we are in this rush today, my perception is that overall, the requirements of people with disabilities are kind of not really on the agenda yet and that we must make sure altogether that it's on the agenda. The accessibility, the digital train has left the station. It may not be too late to stop to welcome visitors and users with disabilities. Um, another aspect is that for about 50 years, museums throughout the world have begun to work with improving access for disabled people. A historic moment was in your country in 1961, when the Mary Duke Biddle Gallery uh, for the Blind in North Carolina opened, and for four years offered 30 touch exhibitions to blind and partially sighted people to provide a comprehensive uh, overview and tangible experience uh, of world cultures. Uh, that was in the analog physical world, and I think it sets a model for what we would like to achieve in the digital world and in the various interactions between the two. What I've noticed, having worked for nearly 30 years full time in this area, is that progress there may be. Great examples of good practice in individual institutions, but overall, progress happens piecemeal. It is not sustainable because it's not on a priority that is high enough in the institution, and very seldom at a regional, uh, even local and national level is it seen in a strategic way. So in the face of these realities, we want to up the game and show what our sector can offer. Um, I thought to reflect a bit on what the, really the purpose of museums is, or heritage, I'll be very brief. Uh, Giuseppe Ungaretti, the Italian poet, says in his shortest of poems, I illuminate myself with immensity. It's about the, uh, the limitless joys and mind-opening spaces that museums are there to offer and provide. Whether we do it well or not is another as a matter, but that is really the potential and roles for museums for just about every visitor. And that means that sharing and the learning from sharing, which means also yielding power, changing the relationships, is there to be uh, reflected on and practiced. These kind of uh, poetic values of heritage gel very well together with the recognition for the first time in human history of what I call the cultural rights of people with disabilities. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities has an article number 30 that says, people with disabilities have the right to take part on an equal basis. I stress that one and will come back to that one, trying to qualify or maybe relativize it a bit or focus it in cultural life. It took about 50 years since the UN Declaration on the Human Rights of uh, that actually the cultural rights of disabled people specifically 
got accepted. It's a very important landmark in thinking, and it will have expressions and impact on national legislations and cultural policies in many countries over time. So in relation to this kind of requirement, or at least utopian aspiration of equal access, how far have we got? I gave you half of the answer, which is mine. I'm happy to objectify it. But on the way to the inclusive museum, people with a disability face far too many barriers. For visually impaired viewers or listeners here, we have a picture of a wheelchair user in front of exhibits, a table of exhibits, her eyes at the level of the exhibits, not getting the overview. That is not a dignified museum experience. So issues of fundamental human dignity come in here as well. I'd also say that overwhelming evidence shows that museums are not very accessible. Without being very scientific, I'd look at the world and I'd say maybe 10 museum websites have, or have really good audio descriptions for blind and partially sighted people, which they skillfully weave into the interpretive commentary or the telling of stories of museums. Not many more museums have intellectual and learning content for deaf people. Few museums have engaged with people with a learning disability on the on online level, similarly with people with dyslexia, and we could go on. A very compelling statistic, which comes from a piece of research Professor Petri, who will be talking to you later, has undertaken in 2005 for the Museums, Libraries and Archives Council in England, for which I worked. Uh, it showed that on 300 museum library archive websites, only 3% met something called Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Level AA, which are those almost worldwide, at least in the Western world and in some advanced economies, uh, public sector websites should meet. So that's quite a compelling example. There's, there are complex realities behind it, but it shows us that we should be, I would say that, speeding up the gear. Uh, I just thought, well, challenge is one of the titles I have here, and we want to address together as colleagues with different competencies. Oh, this is not the right one. Uh, one is about the challenge of accessibility, that there are many barriers remaining. I do not believe that equal access can ever be granted. How could we describe all the paintings or artworks or science objects in a skillful and great way for blind people in our own museum. What we want to look at is maybe something more that edges towards the notion of quality access. Quality access needs choice and opportunity, not just the crumbs of five uh, sculptures of limited value to touch, something a bit more, something more in the long term, and this for all groups of disabled people. So. In 1992 already, the Council of Europe, which brings together about 50 countries of a total population somewhat exceeding that of the United States, uh, had a beautiful policy on independent li living of disabled people, saying that at the local and national level, we ought to get comprehensive plans and policies underway to create significant and lasting improvement. So very often what we do uh, is being lost because it's not prioritized, it's short-term funding and whatnot. By significant, I would like to create a connection with the limitless value of the collections of the museums in the world. And in comparison with that limitless value, what are we offering people with a disability on their own terms, with their own best, most accessible medium of communication? Very, very little indeed. So there is plenty of scope for progress. One of the things that is needed in terms of strategic analysis of need is to build knowledge and skills. We need to bring together existing skills between from social, cultural and technological skills of museums. They are often not put together. Audio describing is a skill that has been there for 20 years, uh, of course in theatre cinemas, but also in the everyday practice of museum educators. 
Sometimes it's improvised, sometimes it's skillful and knowledgeable, but that skill is not put onto digital media. Just to give you one example, we also need to learn to look more widely to the social sector, to research, to further education and education for people with a disability and see how people learn there. What can we use, learn from their uses of technology and nurture plentiful of new knowledge? Today is really an opportunity, a first one hopefully of many, where this bringing together of different strands and complementary strands of knowledge, but all necessary, can come here and can begin to, to communicate well. And we mustn't forget that user-centeredness is our underpinning value. Very quickly, what I wanted to say, the good news is that apart from the many challenges, uh, we have seen that great accessibility projects aimed at one group of disabled people actually boost the creativity of the institution itself and tend to be uh, of a quality that widens accessibility for the many, for many different audiences. So, on uh, the last session, uh, Widening Audiences Part 4, I will talk to you in greater detail about Tate IMAP, which set out to analyze Picasso and Matisse online for blind and partially sighted people in a way of visual and descriptive analysis that actually stretches the capacities of museums to present knowledge to just about everyone. It's a just mind-blowing example of that. Another example I'll be talking about in greater detail tomorrow afternoon is uh, using animation, and you will get some example today from Cine de Sens in France, uh, to move towards a language of almost universal communication. The Science Museum in Paris, Cité des Sciences, for example, provides animation for each of their temporary exhibitions. Kids and parents lie on the floor watching content which deaf people watch, minimal language. Here it's a process of erosion of stone forming into mud and later into mud houses that's shown just on one steel. It's not accessible to blind people, there is no audio description. So we want to remember that we are moving towards something more inclusive, but here may well be a language that was used in a museum for deaf people, but that may become a language of communication for all in the next 15 to 20 years. And just to remind ourselves with a metaphor from the analog physical world, accessibility serves everyone. The ramp, the accessibility features in the physical environment are not just there for people who are wheelchair users, they make it more easy for everyone. The same thing needs to happen indeed in the virtual world. Thank you. Perfect timing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marcus, not less for being on perfect time. I'd like to ask Rebecca McGinnis to join us now. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, let's see. Um, I'm Rebecca McGinnis, and I, uh, I work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art as a, an educator there. I oversee access and community programs, um, but also within my role is acting as a, a sort of internal advisor on accessibility throughout the museum. So I work uh, with, with my colleagues throughout the museum and elsewhere. I'm not a digital media specialist. Um, in session three tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about uh, delivery of accessible content and specifically description for people who are blind or partially sighted through technology. But uh, this, this, uh, for this session, I wanted to give us a kind of a grounding, a very brief introduction to um, the reasons why, uh, some of the reasons why accessibility matters, and then really focus a little bit on uh, the, the US legislation that concerns accessibility um, generally and uh, potentially and actually to digital media as well. So we have um, the Americans with Disabilities Act is the, the, the primary piece of, of legislation uh, that's civil rights and anti-discrimination legis legislation relating to people with disabilities, so that's one uh, good reason. There are about 54 million Americans with disabilities, and that's something like just almost one in five people. So it's a very large number of, of people we're talking about, not a small minority, and uh, it's a minority that anyone can join at any time as well, um, which is uh, something to keep 
keep in mind. And as Marcus has just said, um, the features that we offer uh, that make anything accessible to people with disabilities potentially helps many other people as well. We can also, uh, again, as, as Marcus has said, uh, kind of look at, at the, uh, the fact that everyone has the right to participate fully in the cultural life of their community, and that includes um, online and through other digital media. It also makes good business sense to be accessible. The large and growing market of people with disabilities has $175 billion in discretionary spending. Um, and that's that's four times the spending power of tweens, who, that, and that's a, a kind of demographic that many people are, are after at the moment. And of course, museums as public institutions are committed to creating a positive experience for all visitors. And as we extend ourselves more and more into uh, the digital realm, uh, it applies there as well. Uh, so um, on to the legislation. As I mentioned, the key um, piece is the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little more in a minute. There's also Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. The Rehabilitation Act was passed in, in 1973, but uh, 1998 Section 508 was, was added concerning um, online access. I'll talk about that, or, or access to technology, and I'll talk a, a bit more about that. The 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, which is very recent, and, and there, there are a couple of different um, advance notice of proposed rulemaking um, uh, documents or uh, you know, proposals that I could talk about, but I'm uh, just mentioning here the one focusing on non-discrimination on the basis of disability, accessibility of web information and services of state and local gov government entities and public accommodation. So the proposed rulemaking that concerns including uh, the web specifically and directly uh, as um, covered under the ADA, basically. So the, the Americans with Disabilities Act is, is a broad non-discrimination, has a broad non-discrimination mandate um, that concerns access to goods and services provided by uh, entities, including on, on their websites, we could, we could argue, because if the, there's the mandate to provide, um, is that my, my time? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be, be quick. Um, to provide accessibility of services, including what we have online. Um, effective communication is ter the terminology that's often used in, uh, uh, in the ADA, and communicating about our goods and services um, must be accessible. And I'll, I'll skip over these, the, these, uh, these sort of definitions, which I've really talked about already. Um, there is one, uh, one court case to be aware of. Um, there was a National Federation of the Blind versus Target in 2006. And they did, the finding was that um, Target did need to make their website accessible. Uh, people were unable to make purchases. And um, it was determined that um, the ADA uh, was applicable uh, because of the, even though the ADA was passed in 1990 before any of this technology existed, the, the, the mandate is there and very clear. Um, Section 508, uh, which I mentioned, I think I won't go into. It, it applies to federal agencies, but it, it in, and access making technology and information provided through technology accessible to both employees and members of the public. And it does relate to uh, government agencies, but it shows you kind of where things are moving in terms of the need to be um, accessible, the need to offer accessible technology. Um, maybe I'll leave the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act to, to Larry, who's, uh, who's following me. Um, but that is a recent legislation that uh, was just passed last year that ensures that communication, media services, and video content are accessible. And that includes um, uh, accessible user interfaces. Um, captioning of video programming is, key, is a key part of it on TV and uh, internet distribution to broadcast uh, videos. Um, and also it, it uh, provides for uh, 50 hours every quarter of audio described uh, broadcast uh, TV video. Um, so those are significant changes to um, 
access requirements, signif significant advances. And it also includes um, the requirement that browsers on cell phones must support accessibility, for example, so mobile technologies are included there. Um, and the notice for proposed rulemaking, as I mentioned, was just um, it's really focusing on uh, the importance of um, the, all the different things that, that people can do online and the need to include formally uh, that uh, platform in, uh, in everything that's already uh, uh, required under the ADA. So it's really bringing the ADA up to date in terms of technologies that are available. So, and I'm going to finish there and hand over to Larry, who I think doesn't have, you didn't, no, you didn't have a slide, okay. Uh, my name is Larry Goldberg and I'm a technoholic. This is like an AA meeting here. Um, no, I'm not using that. Interesting that it's coming up anyway. Um, so over the next few days, we're going to talk about some really interesting uses of technology. Uh, I'm from an organization called the National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH in Boston. We're part of public, public broadcasting, and we do research and development on technology and accessibility. Uh, I say I love technology because it does amazing things to lower barriers, but like alcohol, if misused, can create some problems, and we'll see about both sides of that. But I really like talking about what technology can do and how it can help. And I think about the museum visits and when you go to the museum, how it's a phenomenal combination of very intensely personal experiences and very social ones. I think about the time I went to see uh, the Maplethorpe exhibit at the MFA in Boston. Lines around the block, thousands of people trying to get in. Uh, it was very social, very controversial. But as soon as you got in the door and found yourself standing in front of one of his photographs, you were involved in a very deeply personal experience. And I think that's part of what technology can do for people with disabilities, people who are older, um, to be able to personalize their experience at a museum. I had a, another great experience. Uh, we do some work for the Whitney Museum in New York. And we went in one day when the museum was closed, and I had a chance to stand in front of de Kooning's Woman and Bicycle by myself, alone in the gallery for like an hour. And that was such an intensely personal experience. Not many people get a chance to do that. Um, but I think some of the technologies we'll get a chance to look at, you'll see that that is something that can be extended to more people when they need to have a personalized experience. So we'll talk about personalizing uh, as well. Um, that personalized experience is not just for when you're on site at a museum, but when you're online. And it's that virtual experience before a visit, after a visit, or maybe you never even get to the museum that can be even more readily adapted uh, if you have a special way of viewing or experiencing a museum. Um, especially if you're looking at issues of travel. Um, I can't get to the Louvre every day, but if I could travel there online, um, there's expense, there's adapting the, the, uh, the museum itself. You can provide a lot more online and even entice people when you get there to have a much better personalized experience. The uh, personalized tools that we'll have a chance to look at, when they're done best and when they're really well created are very simple, they're ubiquitous and pervasive, they're not selective, like just one person can use them in their own way, but can be spread across many populations. Um, when they're mainstream using devices like iPhones and iPads, which everyone here right now is using, put down your pads. Um, and it's when the museum and the user can control the experience, when you can adapt it for yourself. There's a lot of settings on your devices where you have a special device that you like to use yourself. Um, if you work with the blind community, you know that there's special technologies they like using. Uh, the notion of bring your own accessibility, BYA, to a museum is really growing uh, because people are more comfortable with their own personal devices. Um, of course, mobile devices are key, and I know that uh, the work being done by this organization and many others in the field, certainly by Nancy, is really the key way many people are trying to both employ and exploit our little robotic friends. I, I think about, um, I just got the iPhone 4S, I'm very excited, I uh, have a really very close relationship with Siri now, and I think about 
going to the Tenement Museum in New York City. Has anyone been to the Tenement Museum? An amazing place. Imagine if you could have Siri guide you through those various buildings down in the Lower East Side, maybe even using a accented voice for the immigrant populations who brought you there and to describe all that's going on. Well, you know, the technology can actually do that today. And uh, not now, but in the next few sessions, I'll actually show you a few ways that these kinds of experiences, like the Tenement Museum, like the High Art Museum we'll see tonight, can really be made very accessible. Um, I should mention we're not just talking about museums. The National Park Service happens to be one of the most cutting edge institutions in terms of bringing accessibility to all their visitors. Your tax dollars at work, um, they really do a wonderful job of trying to make sure that when you visit a national park and the visitor centers, you're being given lots of opportunities to experience it in your own way. Uh, we'll talk over the next few days about how to hack the museum experience for accessibility. Um, I'm going to show um, at the next session and tomorrow morning something called rear window captioning, a way to bring captioning into theater muse museum theaters. Um, it's been around for quite a while. Video description for blind people. Rebecca is going to explain to us why a blind person would even want to go to a museum. It's an interesting question, but deserves an answer. Um, and then we're going to play with something called uh, Media Access Mobile. I had a chance to show it to the folks at Smithsonian recently. We're now two generations later, and anyone who has a smartphone or an iPad can get online and actually use their own device today uh, to watch some accessibility on some media that I'll be showing. Um, Rebecca did mention uh, the Communications and Video Accessibility Act, signed by President Obama, uh, October 2010. The really interesting aspects of this new federal law are that uh, websites with video that have previously had that video on broadcast television will need to have those captions online, which means that a website like Hulu that's rebroadcasting a TV show will have to have their captions available and those rules will go into effect next year. We also now have a mandate for video description on television. We'll give you some samples of video description, how a piece of media can be made accessible to a blind person. Now the top nine cable and broadcast networks will each be providing 50 hours a quarter of description. That means 450 hours per quarter of description on television starting next summer. That'd be quite amazing. And what's really exciting is part of this new law says that your set-top box will have to be accessible to you if you have a vision problem, which means it's going to have to talk to you. It's going to have to guide you through the technology, which is a good idea for any technology you're using, mobile or PC or your own television screen. So accessible UI is going to be mandated, is mandated, and how cable companies and satellite companies pull that off is still open to dis uh, discussion. And finally, uh, mobile devices, as uh, was mentioned, will also have to have accessible browsers so that people can really uh, have inclusive technology in their hand and in their pockets. So I just want to thank uh, the organizers and Marcus and everyone for bringing this together. It's a very timely gathering. I'm actually very optimistic about where we stand in the world of accessible media and accessible museums. Uh, sure, we've been at it for 50 or 60 years, but we'll get it right eventually. Why not this week? I think we really can, and we're going to see some ways we can do that uh, today and tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Larry, not least for the enthusiasm and the optimism. Always much appreciated. Um, I'd now like to ask Helen Petrie and uh, Chris Power. Power. Thank you. Handwriting not very good, and I no never know problem. anyone's last name. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Um, we've lost our template somewhere along the way. So if you come tomorrow or later today to some of our sessions, you'll see a really, really nice piece of uh, old historic York as part of our template. But for now, it's just going to be somewhat plain. Sorry, That's <laughs> OK. Um, so Helen and I are from the University of York. We're both researchers in human-computer interaction. And one of our focuses is looking at people with disabilities and access on the web, and we've extended that to looking at digital access, in particular in museums and art galleries and a number of other places. Um, a lot of people associate accessibility with just being on the web, and that's something that's changing as we see the convergence of technology 
from the web onto devices like the iPad and the iPhone and these sorts of things. Accessibility is now extending beyond the web, but using web technology through a lot of it. So a lot of the types of design principles that we've learned, we can apply to these new technologies. And we'll be talking a little bit about that over the next couple of days. Um, the other thing that we try to emphasize is that a lot of people tend to associate the term of accessibility with one or more groups of people, either a group of people as users or using a particular piece of technology. And we really take a broader extent of that. We, we look at a diversity of users, a diversity of visitors, using a diversity of technologies. And we find that that has some resonance in particular in this community. Okay, so one of the things we emphasize is that there's a wide range of different audiences and we now have the technological potential to help a wide range of different people who may seem to have very different requirements and interests, but within one, for example, multimedia framework. So it's important to consider, particularly when we talk to web developers and application developers, they tend to be aware that, yes, blind people have difficulty seeing things. This is, of course, a big revelation, um, but <laughs> there are a lot more people involved here. So people with Visual impairments not only includes those who are totally blind, but people who are partially sighted. And we often find that technologists have a lot more difficulty making things accessible to people who are partially sighted. And in fact, we've left off our slide, people with color vision deficiencies, which is a really interesting thing to consider when you're looking at museums and artwork. And I often find that the people who are most interested in color are my friends who can't see color, my friends who have color vision deficiencies. Um, my, one of my best friends is totally monochromat, and she knows much more about color than I do, um, which she finds very odd. Uh, then, of course, we have people with different kinds of hearing impairments, people who use sign language, people who are deafened, and people who are hard of hearing. And these different groups of people have different needs and interests. We mustn't forget people who have different kinds of physical impairments. We tend to work with web accessibility with people who can't use a keyboard or a mouse, and there are alternatives for those, but now as we move to mobile devices, that opens up a whole new set of issues but that are being addressed by technologists. And finally, there are people with cognitive impairments, generalized cognitive impairments, but also people with specific learning difficulties, particularly relevant dyslexia. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more. But we're going to tell you about the different sessions and activities that we'll be involved in over the next couple of days. Back to Chris. So later this afternoon, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, people with physical disabilities and the technologies that they use. Now, this is something that often isn't talked about a lot in terms of web technology because we find that there aren't a lot of con um, problems at the technological level of interaction between different types of technologies that physical people with physical disabilities use. However, as we're moving into a phase where people are bringing technology with them, we're likely to start seeing a lot more of these different devices in open spaces, working in different venues, and it's important to realize some of the design principles that go along with that. And I'll be reviewing a few of the different technologies that are available. It's a relatively short session, but it'll give you sort of some highlights to look at and some things to be aware of as you move forward in planning your exhibits. And then tomorrow morning, I'm going to talk about dyslexic audiences and to continue Larry's theme of addiction. My name is Helen and I'm a dyslexic. Um, and I feel that dyslexics are people who can be greatly assisted by technology uh, quite s in quite simple ways in terms of the technology if we combine that with personalization and customization of interfaces. Uh, but we tend to get forgotten as a group who can be helped. So I'll talk about uh, the difficulties that dyslexics help and the simple ways uh, that we can change the presentation of material to make things much easier. And then Chris. 
So in the uh, second half of that session, after Larry speaks, uh, he'll be on about 9.40, 9.45. I'll be on at 10 o'clock talking about different aspects of digital accessibility for audiences who are blind or partially sighted, looking at the different types of technologies that they use and particular problems that are run into according to empirical research that we've had over the last five years about specific problems that people run into regarding their technology or regarding interaction with content. And we'll talk about how a relatively small number of changes to the way that you prepare things can help an extremely large number or wide variety group of people and that will be emphasized in that. Um, that will lead into Saturday where we have a big workshop for three hours or three and a half hours. We'll give you a coffee break, we promise. Um, but that workshop is going to be largely about web accessibility but we will touch on other aspects of accessibility because as I said there's a convergence happening right now and soon I don't think we'll be talking about web accessibility the way we used to. Um, one thing that we will be emphasizing in that is that we're not interested in web content accessibility guidelines. The guidelines are there, we will tell you about what they are and why you have to meet them and then we're going to put them aside and instead we're going to talk about a new vision for how we approach accessibility. Instead of looking at the problems that people have and the types of problems that they encounter and then designing to avoid those problems, instead we'll turn around and look at design principles for people with different disabilities and looking specifically at how can you work from the point of view of what you want to design so that you not only meet the guidelines but you're producing something that you want as part of your exhibit or online. And so that's a really different way of approaching it that we have found people in this sector in particular respond to a lot better than the stick approach of you have to meet this for compliance reasons. We'll still tell you about that, but we'll take it from a slightly different approach. And then finally on Saturday afternoon, if anyone still has any energy left, we'll have a digital accessibility clinic. It is in the program as going from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. That's not quite going to work because we have to leave for the airport to go back to England at 4.30 p.m. So we will be available from 2 to 3.30 if people would like to come and talk about their particular um, accessibility issues, if they'd like some help, some one-to-one -one, um, discussion, we will be available and we can continue that discussion via email or Skype or these fancy technological things that people have these days. Um, after the conference, so please, please come and talk to us. Otherwise, we'll be lonely. Mm -hmm. And that's it for us. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Okay. So let me just be clear: Is Simon going to speak now, or just Emmanuel? Okay, Simon, please. So, uh, hello, I'm quite happy to be here and like everybody did, I just thank you all the persons that make the, this happen. Uh, I will try to explain you shortly what we are doing in Signe de Sens, which is a French uh, non-profit organization that works on accessibility. And the basis of our work was with deaf people using sign language. And then we extended it uh, step by step. So I will try to explain you this kind of movement coming from uh, I mean, I would say like a really precise field of work and then extending the vision and those tools we have. Um, so first thing was who we are and uh, sin de sens, which means in a way like meaningful science and science should be intended like um, understood like uh, all the different kind of science. So it's not about using only sign language, but really like mixing different ways of putting information into signs. So writing is a sign, miming is a sign, sign language is another sign, etc. So it's really mixing different signs. And the first step was the access to, uh, to knowledge for deaf people uh, by innovating on the pedagogy to improve this access. And I started the organization because I created it almost 10 years ago because the situation was really difficult for deaf people in my region and in France. And the equivalent of your uh, Disability Act was our law of 2005. So it's like a gap between the two dates, as you can see it. So it was really difficult because nothing was really pushed by law. Um, 
So it was really the starting point. Like, how can we help deaf people to get knowledge, to get education, to get to the social places like museums, but also libraries, and etc. Uh, and then second step was um, how to spread those innovations because we felt like we had created some things that would be really interest a lot of other people, and that doesn't came f that didn't came from us, but it really came from people who come to us and say, "Oh yeah, I use this for this, and my child is not deaf, but he's really like this, and etc." So we started to think about how we can extend this value we have we had created with deaf people. Um, so this second step is really interesting because it's not about how we can give to deaf people, but why we should invest uh, into the deaf community because we can have so many things back, uh, which is far more interesting as a society <coughs> way of uh, exchanging among all the different communities or population. Like everybody needs to receive, but also to give something to feel balance i would say like in relationship with the others not always asking for something but also like i have something to do who wants to listen to it etc so the situation uh, is quite difficult for deaf people so deaf people still is people using sign language and who usually were born deaf um, and uh, we had to face a lot of illiteracy so when we started, it was like, how can we tell story to children? We started by using uh, sign language and uh, oral uh, language at the same time. But thing was, we noticed a lot of deaf kids we are uh, we were facing didn't really add all the tales background. I would say so uh, they were not really always connecting the information we were using. Like, okay, a kid, for instance, I talked some kids of 11, 12. And they were reading stories of kids for five, five, six years old. So there was really a gap between what they are supposed to know, like normal cultural background, and the things they already they actually had. So we started to think like, wow, how can we do this? And then we had um, workshops, and we mixed children, hearing, and deaf, and we had to face also this kind of difference. And the thing is, when you have this kind of difference, you can say, OK, deaf children are a bit like more uh, stupid than hearing children. So that's the reason why. It's not our fault. But then you can also think like, OK, there is really a problem in giving the information. So I mean, we don't train them in a good way, because actually they can't develop the skills. And nobody has never proven that deaf people have a special brain. <laughs> so it can't be f coming from physical things. It just should come from education. So that really was the starting point. It was not about treating social issues of deaf adults, but helped deaf children to get knowledge to avoid social issues. That's why it was about education. We had really few tools adapted, that's what I was explaining. Sign language was really introduced in school in 2005, uh, so which could be completely amazing for uh, for you, maybe, if you know the situation of uh, deaf people here, because they use sign language far more uh, and funny thing is that it's a French guy who brings sign language in the US. But actually, we just give it and we didn't keep anything. <laughs> but then, uh, that's really strange. So, and then you have, as a consequence, a lot of unemployment. And when we talk about unemployment, it's also about talking about like uh, social isolation. Because you have communication issues, you don't really have social life, working, and etc. So it's the thing. And it's quite a lot of people because we have number is like 300,000 uh, people who say, okay, we don't have really um, nice oral communication. We are not really at ease in oral communication. Um, thing is that these are uh, all the difficulties faced by deaf people, but then we also learned a lot from these experiences, and especially on uh, visual communication, of course. Uh, but it's also like uh, how you learn things, how you get the information, why would you be interested in something or not, etc. So it was really a lot of things we learned from uh, exchanging and discussing with people deaf, um, because a lot of deaf people, adults, also have really interesting skills to share, but usually nobody knows. So it was really a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, people I've met was really amazing. I was like, oh, what do nobody interest into you? So um, that's just a thing. It's not just a black uh, situation. It's really still shining a bit. Um, so the organization was created in 2003 in France. We are now 10 employees and we work with a lot of different um, freelancers 
who works with us on the different production. And then our activity is growing. And then it's really about innovation and uh, dynamism. And we are recognized for this in France. Like we are recognized for trying to m create new tools to face the situations. For instance, our goal is not really um, uh, like, OK, we have this media. How can we make it accessible? But it's more about, OK, we have this thing we want to give. So we have this content, we have this goal, we have this audience. We want to touch them, we want to give this. What can we create from scratch that would be accessible? So it's not about, OK, I've done all the job, and now, OK, wow, I have to face the situation of accessibility. Like, oh, I've done all my website, now I will have to make it accessible, which is really a horrible situation. But then if you say, OK, I want to make a website for everybody, and I will, oh, yeah, I will have this situation and this constraint, and etc., then you are coming with, like, uh, yeah, like it's a challenge. You have creativity under constraints, which is really a way of creati of, uh, uh, of innovation, and it's not about uh, disabilities, but it's really general way of uh, innovation. It's like having constraints, having a challenge, and then they, yeah, let's do it. So it's really the way we took it, and uh, we succeeded into it. Like working with huge uh, institutions f uh, like the Louvre or other in Paris, also with some ministries, but also with really small institutions in our region. So we also try to say, okay, all, everybody doesn't have the same situation. So you can't come to us saying, OK, what can you sell to me that will make my museum accessible? It's not really the goal. It's more like, OK, I would really like to have this. And how could we do something interesting for this project? Uh, so it, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's what the little bell meant. <laughs> oh, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't get it, sorry. Um, and then we have uh, some principles. I mean, a lot of deaf people are involved in the project at a different stage. Uh, we work with a lot of different networks. That means uh, we have one role in the whole project, but we also mix with people from uh, universities, people from the museums, people from the different communities, we also people from the education system, etc. So it's also like mixing all the different skills and viewpoints to create something interesting for everybody. And then the question of stability, like sustainability, it's like economic model, has a lot of museums also have to face uh, on the development of application or else. It's like, how can we make it sustainable? Uh, and evaluation, which is really a major point of everything we are doing. It's like, we are not doing things to sell it. It's we are doing things to try to make things interesting and convenient and uh, efficient. So we are really interested in, is it really efficient? If it's not, we just stop or we move, we change, we improve. So it really is the way we work. I won't go further. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was just supposed to stop here. Just, I will explain later, I think, uh, one of the projects more in details. But then you can also come to us to just have discussions about this. So thank you. Okay, so I'd like to uh, give the podium to Emmanuel von Schack now. Okay, this is my PowerPoint. All set. Hello, everyone. I'm Emmanuel and Von Schock, and I'm with the Met in New York City um, doing a project, um, and I also work with Rebecca. She's uh, one of my senior bosses. Today, what I'll be discussing is I'll be uh, discussing a little bit more about um, the project that I'm working on um, in this session, and the next one I'll be focusing more in depth about um, this particular project, but I just wanted to give you an overview right now about accessibility for deaf people. So why do we need this? Let me explain the importance of it. To clarify, deaf people includes a wide range of populations, including those who are deaf and later in life, those who use sign language, and understanding that those who do use sign language is a very small percentage of the deaf population. And I can explain more about that. Marcus had already explained about the UN Convention and the rights of people with disabilities. So it's required by law. And Rebecca also mentioned the Americans with Disabilities Act and how legislation has required accessibility But I don't want to focus on the legal aspects of it. Um, 
that some of it can be sort of a negative connotation and sound like it's burdensome for um, for places to accommodate people with disabilities. But the point is to make things accessible for people with, that are deaf. And what is the cultural role of the museum? And the point is to preserve the culture and share culture with those people and that population. They are citizens. And we are all citizens of the world today. People also um, from all over the world come to visit us in New York City. We are in international museums, so we like to share our culture. And it's a huge responsibility, and it's very important that um, we provide accessibility. That's part of our role and function. We also can show the history of how the museum has changed and adapted through the years. Not only, um, it's not only just a place for wealthy people anymore to view, like it used to be. That's how, it, how museums have start, had started, but now we have a much broader base of audiences that come to the museum, not just those who are wealthy, but people who, um, are, not, or who are not, so they can all view it at the same time. The demographic, the demographics of the, excuse me, the demarcation of society is no longer involved with museum viewing. We have made it a cultural institute for people with disabilities to be able to be involved as well. So the evolution of the museum access, um, how it's changed for deaf people. I'll touch a little bit about that on that now, and I'll explain that more in depth later at the next session. So we've got transcribed audio guides. Um, so those of you that can hear are able to hear and watch the um, exhibits and the artwork and everything going on in the museum. And it's a wonderful way to learn more about exhibits and the art and all of the things that we have on display. But how, are those, how is that information accessible? We transcribe it so that um, the deaf population can read it. And I can explain more in the next session about the benefits to that and some of the um, cons to that as well. In addition, museums um, would like to take the next step in providing sign language interpreters for tours. Occasionally, we do have interpreters that come through um, for, for tours so that deaf people can view them together. And it's a specific population that is able to take the tour together. And interpreted tours are the next, um, one of the next things we, we'd like to have more of. We have deaf museum educators in New York at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, we have incentives, excuse me. Innovate, the Met is innovative. I'm sorry, initiative. We have initiatives that um, we have established for um, for our goals for the future. For example, we would like to provide training for um, deaf people in order for them to be aware of, of things going on with the exhibits and the art so that they can explain that to other deaf people. And so also interpreters can um, voice for the deaf presenters or speak in English what they're presenting in sign language. That way, um, other museums in New York City will follow that um, new initiative and follow the example in, in other museums as well, such as the, the Whitney and other museums in the area. They'll, they'll be able to provide deaf presentations as well. There are several museums in New York and also um, in Europe, that, such as the Louvre, that have followed this example. The Tate um, Modern Museum has, as well. And there's several other museums that are starting to have deaf presentations on the exhibits, so it's starting to become um, more popular. Now, what we've got today, um, what we like to focus on more and more is technology and making that accessible with resources, including captioning and sign language interpreting of exhibits, as well as um, Simone was talking about um, 
how we can use the technology to provide access for deaf people. And that's also what um, I would like to present a little bit about. It's something that we've been working on and we're still progressing with, um, how we can use technology for deaf people. I can, I'll be touching on more of this. Um, and I've, we have provided accessibility for deaf people with these four points. And there are positives and negatives to each one of these. And the next steps that we need to take um, to continue to improve these enhancements, enhancing these things for the future, for accessibility for deaf people. I'll explain more about this in the next session. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. We're looking forward to, tomorrow, to the next session. And um, next I'd like to ask Susan Nichols to speak. Hello. Um, Susan Nichols with the Smithsonian American Art Museum, head of education there in Washington, D.C. Y'all come. Um, I was invited by a deaf um, colleague, uh, a person at the uh, Gallaudet, which is about uh, three miles from our museum, and it's the premier university for deaf students. We had no programs for deaf um, people, not even uh, by request, although we did have programs for blind people by request only. So this young woman lives in the same neighborhood I do, and she asked me to come to a program she had set up in which she had uh, hearing artists speak about their artwork in the galleries uh, at a private collection to deaf um, high school, college students. And I came along, and I was very impressed and um, had been <clears throat> uh, eager to... Uh, not eager enough to take any action, but internally eager enough to um, provide services for um, uh, deaf uh, visitors. So I would just like you to, um, oh my God, it's, what, how do I get it to go forward? Oh, I know, it's this one. Okay, I got it, I got it, okay, okay. They changed computers on me again. Um, I just want you to bear with me while I write, uh, read the first paragraph of a paper I wrote. Um, imagine it's a busy Saturday at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C., a not of a dozen adult visitors in animated conversation with their gallery guide. The guide and his cohort are one of our Saturday afternoon art science tours for deaf visitors. Add to the mix an American Sign Language interpreter to voice information and queries, observations and exchanges for hearing staff and visitors. Then art signs morphs into a bilingual tour with the opportunity for hearing and deaf audiences to learn together under the leadership of a deaf guide. I don't really have to say any more. I mean, that is what it is for us. We have given what the deaf community has called us, uh, has, has identified itself, the empowerment of leading a deaf and hearing audience in a respected institution. But I'll go on. We started this in 2009. It was a gallery guide program in the museum. In 2010, uh, 2010, we um, enlarged it to be an online program, which I'll speak about um, this afternoon. We found that um, we were able to engage deaf visitors in a meaningful way, uh, that uh, it was in our collection, and the deaf gallery guides chose the artworks they wanted to work with, so some shows folk, some shows contemporary. Um, it did vary, and it was entirely at the discretion of the, um, of the deaf gallery guide. We provided them with materials online so they could then take it and put it into their own voice, basically. Um, we were able to enlarge our volunteer corps and um, uh, to include deaf visitors. And we were able to provide circumstances in which hearing visitors had a chance to uh, interact um, uh, with deaf visitors, a chance that um, I as a, hum as a he hearing person don't get uh, except for this opportunity. Uh, we had a recruitment period. We advertised um, widely, but uh, the bulk of our candidates for volunteers came from the Gallaudet community. We, um, I think we had 12 or 14 show up. We didn't turn anybody away, but only eight, after we told them was involved, um, agreed to participate. We held the training, much as we do for our docents, which was intensive. It was 16 hours. We gave model tours. Again, we had uh, the support of our Office of Accessibility at Smithsonian. Thank you very much, Beth, um, to provide uh, interpreters so that when we were speaking about our collection by 
objects and also the means by which you have provide an interactive tour rather than a directed um, lecture tour, the, um, the services of the interpreters were key. We had them do research on two or three objects that they wanted to begin their program with. Uh, they did a sample tour. Their colleagues, their deaf colleagues provided um, feedback, as did obviously the, uh, the, my colleagues and I. The format for our presentations in the galleries are identical to the formats we use with our docents. Um, they are formal in the sense that um, there is a leadership role, but they are informal in the sense that the content, while the content stays the same, it's very much a question and answer um, and uh, conversational format. The number of objects varies. A lot of times the, vol the volunteers began with one object that was where they were comfortable with that. We were not sure how long the um, visitors would want to stay. Uh, we got a lot of comments after the first couple of months, can't you do two artworks? Well, of course we can do two artworks. Do you want to stay for two artworks? Yeah, 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 I'd like a whole tour. And we started using uh, temporary exhibitions rather than limiting it to, to, um, private, uh, to permanent collection objects. This is one of our gallery guides um, with an audience in one of our permanent collection galleries. And while we have no formal evaluation yet, uh, we use informal evaluation, um, visitor comments, both um, translated through the interpreters, but also on comment cards. Um, this one points out the difference between a tour given by a deaf person uh, to a hearing audience and vice versa. Um, they say it makes the experience more tactile and visual and that it provides the deaf individual with a better and more comfortable experience. I can't say how enough how thrilled we were, and I could have chosen more. We began by using the collections in our um, main building, which is this one, and um, uh, after about seven or eight months, we branched off into our other museum, which is across from the White House, which is focused on craft. And this was a museum that I don't think any of the deaf audience had visited. Um, it's it's under visited by most people, but in this case, by the deaf audience we were dealing with. Um, after we had spent a year looking at um, uh, a deaf gallery guide program with these two museums, we have a national, we have a charge at Smithsonian to provide services for local and national audiences. And so we branched out into an online program called Art Signs Online. Uh, that's the topic of my next presentation. And then basically for our lessons learned, um, intelligent people can make good interpreters, doesn't matter if they can hear or not. The marketing strategies um, we're still learning about. We have an online, we have a, um, a group, um, whatever you call it, group, folk, no, 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 a, a group of names that we send out to all the time. It's always, um, always enlarging. The audience is numbered from zero to 50. The zero was the first day we offered it. Imagine how good we felt about that. Um, but 50 was too big, and the staff continues to monitor with the tours. Um, and I was just asked last uh, two weeks ago by one of the deaf gallery guides, why Susan, why do you still come? And honestly, I replied, I said, I really enjoy it. But the truth is that um, I get there early, I advise the two information desks what artworks are going to be discussed initially so that some people who come late will still be able to dire be directed without having a lot of um, pencil writing, note writing um, with the front desk, that um, uh, we find that, and it's not exclusive to deaf audiences, but we find that audiences get so engaged in what they are listening or talking about that they forget they are surrounded by artworks and that um, bumping or conversation can do damage to that and that would really um, damage the program. And lastly, a lot of our um, um, alerts about being safe with artworks are audio. We have one that says, please stand back, and there is no visual sign at all. Another one says, beep, 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 with no other uh, visual sign. And so in those cases, I either anticipate that and say, or uh, if it happens and I haven't seen it to warn it off, I make a point of, of this helping having the interpreter help me by saying, um, 
you're too close to that artwork. So um, I don't really see a time in which we'll not be able to monitor, have a monitor associated with this. Um, the benefits of technology are that we can email everyone back and forth. We can send the volunteers the material they need to complete their um, research for the presentations. And certainly, um, again, with the next presentation, uh, the technology has, allowed it, has afforded us the opportunity to extend the program to a national, international audience. The personal benefits are enormous for the hearing and deaf participants. That's the website for those of you who can't come this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, and could I ask Vivian Kunghaga from Balboa Park to speak now? Um, thank you for coming. My name is Vivian Kunghaga. I'm the deputy director at the Museum of Photographic Arts in San Diego. Um, we are a relatively um, small and new museum. I've started as the director of education in 2000 and. Um, one and has now now become the deputy director there. Um, what I'm going to share with you is how a museum changes its philosophy in terms of accommodating people and visitor comfort and accessibility. I started out, as I said, as the director of education, and at that point, I was the only one who was understanding the needs of our visitors and really pushing the museum to try and accommodate. Um, it's been a long struggle since I started, um, but I want to tell you about how we started to move in that direction and what were the key factors in ha moving the institution forward. Um, so one of the things I wanted to share with you is the title, which is Every Body and Mind Desires Comfort. Um, that came from a registered nurse who had been working very closely with us. And she says, every human has a body and mind. Every body and mind has abilities and disabilities, strengths and weaknesses. And every body and mind desires comfort. And that's really been our premise of moving forward in terms of the museum. So we are located in San Diego in Balboa Park, which has over 30 cultural institutions. Um, our buildings, uh, by the way, were constructed for the 1915 and 1935 expositions. So we are historic buildings, which of course provides numerous issues to deal with um, in terms of accessibility. Um, this is a shot of the inside of our museum. Um, one of the things, we look at a variety of things. We are looking at visitor comfort in general, and in that includes um, d accessibility. So we started in 2009 with a workshop f f at the v Western um, Museum Association. A registered nurse and a learning different specialist came in, and they proposed a workshop where they would use the museum as the test case. Um, they created role-playing cards based on physical and learning dis differences, um, and each participant of that particular workshop was given a card, and they were told to go into the museum, start from the outside of the museum, walk through the museum in that particular role. Um, what came out of it was a very interesting discussion and feedback of here are some of the common issues that everyone found despite the varied roles. And a lot of them are very common issues that every museum faces. Seating, labels, um, lighting, and accessibility into the doors and where things are. Like where's the restroom? Where is the cafe? Um, those type of things. So we started uh, looking at that. We took those role playing cards. We actually, g I gave it to my staff. I made every single staff member on board take the cards, go into the space, and then we had a discussion of what they found. And they had very similar results to the workshop participants as well. So we started with some very small things, um, just signage. One of our issues was our emission prices. Nobody could find it, nobody could see it. The type size was too small. Um, so those were some of the basic things that we started with. We also looked at amenities that we had that nobody knew about. We actually have large print exhibition tests, texts. We have 
um, smartphone tours. We have wheelchairs available. Those were things that we had on site that no one knew about. And again, it was a signage issue. So making sure that those things are available and everybody sees it. Um, those particular information is also on our website. It's also at the front desk. And this is posted at every single entrance area into the galleries as well. Um, we also looked at seating. Uh, we had no seats with backs. We only had benches. And so we did invest money in getting some seating with backs. And we're actually um, submitted several grants that will provide portable seatings as well as variety of seatings, um, some with backs, some with arms, some with uh, more support. Um, technology has been something that we've been implementing in our museum. <laughs> And with each implementation, we are looking at how does the visitor interact with it? And how do we make sure that every visitor, as much as possible, can interact with it? So one of the things we are doing is we are tra transcribing and also putting captions on the videos as much as possible. Of course, with traveling exhibitions, it's always a limitation. We may get video footage that don't have any captions. We try and make sure we at least have the transcriptions available so that we have that available for any guests who need it. Um, we also like to make sure that the visitor have choices. Um, so you'll see the little buttons on the side. That's uh, allowing the visitor to choose what video they want to play. Um, so it's not always on a loop. Um, again, giving the visitor the ability to select and have a say in what they see. Um, audio and different types of audio options. Um, this is something new that we just implemented. It's actually an iPad with um, videos and audio, and we have provided um, earphones, uh, headphones with volume adjustments to help um, our visitors that come in. It's also wheelchair accessible in that um, the iPad is mounted on an uh, ADA approved level. There's seating available that for anybody who wants to sit, but the seating can be pushed away for somebody who needs to get access in there as well. Um, and just a close up of that. Um, with every technology that we're implementing, we are looking at evaluation. Um, we have evaluation once it's upped. We also do evaluation prior to introducing new technology. So this is an example of an exhibition that had varied technology, um, some low tech, some high tech. And uh, we actually uh, had visitors rated in terms of how valuable was it, was it easy to use, and then we've actually analyzed it. Um, we have a growing senior program as well. Uh, the senior population is one of our largest growing de demographics in San Diego. Um, in um, 2050, it is estimated that it's been grown by 145% from today. Um, so it is a target audience for us. It's actually an audience that we identified in our 2009 and 12 strategic plan. Um, we have a program called Sepia, which is Seniors Exploring Photography and, pers and Personal Identity and Art. And in that program, we've had to make minor adjustments to accommodate our seniors. These are some digital cameras that we use, and they have a hard time pushing the button. So what we've done is actually added a little felt piece so they can feel where the button is and so that they can actually be part of the process. It's a very simple little accommodation, but very effective. Um, and just a couple of shots of the program itself. So I do invite you to come and listen and I'll talk a little bit more about how we implemented our changes and some of them are small changes but very effective changes. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, so just to wrap things up, Beth Zubarth, our director of the accessibility program at the Smithsonian, and I are going to talk about a project we're working on. Um, hand over to you to start with, Beth. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I have been working on accessibility in museums for <clears throat> quite a few years, and in the last few years, the, the challenges that um, have been presenting themselves, I've been thinking about it more in terms of random access to content for visitors with disabilities, that um, we have been pretty good about being able to do a prescribed path through exhibitions for visitors, having selected objects or artworks available um, through docents or other means 
but that we haven't really thought about how people with disabilities like to do just what every other visitor does, which is go into an exhibition and choose their route through the exhibition and focus on the objects that they're most interested in. So in particular, people who are blind or have low vision, I think, have a disadvantage in having this random access to exhibitions. And we also have the imperative of having more on-demand access for visitors with disabilities. We can do things by a reservation system you, where you can have a uh, docent um, lead a tour, but to be able to deliver um, information uh, for visitors with disabilities when they just walk into the museum. And I thought about the different types of technologies that are out there, things like acoustic guide antenna, um, guide porch, Orfeo, those types of devices. And um, a number of organizations use those and use those well, but it seemed like that they were not necessarily the next step, that we wanted to look beyond that. And so I presented this challenge to Nancy and I said, what can we do? What, what's the best way for us to really start addressing um, this random access and on-demand access, or as Larry was um, calling it, the personalization of the experience in museums? And so Nancy was, um, as always, brilliant and started thinking about how we could start um, working on this issue. So yes, with um, 136 million collection objects at the Smithsonian, we figured that just uh, hiring a few staff and giving them audio recorders to go around and record um, audio descriptions of our collection objects wasn't really going to get us anywhere very fast. Um, and so it seemed to be a classic case for um, really our mobile strategy, um, which we've articulated our vision for use at the, of mobile at the Smithsonian as using it to recruit the world to help us with our mission of the increase in diffusion of knowledge. The institution has actually been crowdsourcing since the mid-19th century, I discovered. Our very first um, secretary, the secretary sort of the top dog at the Smithsonian, used what was then the uh, new technology of 1847, the telegraph, to crowdsource weather reports from North and South America to create the first National Weather Service. Our second secretary, Secretary Baird, um, worked with citizen scientists who went out and collected and shipped in specimens by the other important new technology of the day, the railroad, um, that formed the uh, basis of the Natural History Museum's collection. Um, so we thought this was ideal to um, really put the Smithsonian not just in people's in people's pockets but literally in their hands and um, create an application that would um, uh, enable them to enable us to create audio verbal descriptions of the collections uh, and the exhibitions at the Smithsonian. We were inspired by the work of an artist as I have so often been in my work in the mobile, mobile field, in this case, um, Halsey Burgund, who created an application for crowdsourcing an audio tour of the decor of a sculpture park. Um, a very simple application. It does two things. It listens, i.e. it enables visitors to audio record themselves, um, and then it, uh, it speaks. I should say it goes the other way around. People speak, or they can listen to what other people have recorded. Um, and we first started out by simply reskinning that application. It's built on an open source platform called Roundware to use it for uh, crowdsourcing oral histories as part of our traveling exhibition service, uh, Stories from Main Street. Um, and that's been used um, since September. And now working with Beth and the team at the National Museum of American History, we're building out that functionality so that we can start crowdsourcing verbal descriptions as well. And it will include functionality that will help um, visitors vote up the best verbal descriptions that they hear, flag anything that might be inappropriate so an administrator can check it out, um, and either work in a hands-on or a hands-off mode, again, catering to people with different kinds of abilities. And so just in conclusion, I'd like to say that um, 
universal design is something that I've been very eager to learn about from working with Beth and others. Um, and we have really articulated accessibility as our number one mobile product development principle at the Smithsonian, not just because it's the right and the ethical thing to do, but I've seen throughout my work with technology that when a design is accessible, it's better for everybody. You know, big signage is easier for everyone to see. Ramps help not just people who use use wheelchairs, but delivery people and staff with heavy loads and people with prams um, and, and, and baby buggies. So this, is, this pr principle is no less true in our use of new technologies and mobile in particular. So this is our aim. Um, I'd like also though to share just one little um, learning that we have ha already had from trying to make our mobile products accessible at the Smithsonian. We were very keen to work with the iOS, Apple's mobile operating system, because it has so much much baked in accessibility for people um, with visual impairments. It does text to speech very well.